So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our school superintendent, Dr. Keith Marty. Good evening. Thanks, Chelsea. Good evening. We're glad that uh, you took the time to come tonight, and uh, we would uh, hope that we can provide an evening of uh, information and opportunity for you to uh, ask some questions. If you did not pick up uh, some handouts, I know some of you had them, but if, please feel free. We have plenty of copies over there of the Q&A and then maps, so help yourself if you haven't picked those up. But before we get started, I'd like to just uh, introduce, there's a lot of people I can introduce, but I'm, I'm particularly going to introduce our, because uh, you're going to hear from some of these folks, I'm going to introduce our uh, four board members, school board members that are here tonight. Um, as you know, we presented the plan to the, the board, and they're here tonight just to, uh, to listen and to be aware of what uh, uh, some of the feedback and concerns may be about the, some of the boundary changes. So first of all, Jeff Todd, our board president, Jeff Todd. Um, Sam Sarantino. Sam, Pam Hill, board director, and Kevin Seltzer. And we may have some other board members arriving um, a little bit later, but we'll introduce them at that time. So again, uh, thank you for, uh, for coming. We always start our uh, discussions to remind folks about our Parkway mission. As you know, we're a mission-driven organization. We take great pride in the work that uh, Parkway has done around uh, it's, it's strategic plan, Project Parkway, for a number of years right now. And this work is very, very important to us in, in so many different ways, whether it's around curriculum, whether it's around the work of making sure our schools are safe and strong. And it's centered around a, a very important uh, four, four C's and certainly looking into our future. So we always like to remind folks that uh, what we do in Parkway is, is focus on mission and want to make sure all our students uh, each year and, and ongoing and eventually graduating uh, certainly graduate was us working to make them stronger, uh, more confident, more curious, uh, and certainly in, in, in the aspect of the words that we have in our mission statement. So uh, we have a process that uh, we use uh, called Facilities uh, 2030. It's actually uh, updated from Facilities 2020 from a few years ago, and now we're moving. I hope I just want to stop. Debbie Hopper, uh, school board member, vice president of the board. Debbie, uh, thank you for coming. Um, so we have a process that has us monitoring um, our facilities needs, our enrollment needs. Uh, it's a group that we, you know, continually uh, use to make sure that Parkway is, uh, again, going back to our mission, making sure that we are conscious of the work that we have in front of us and making sure our schools and our students and our staff uh, have the best opportunity to, to move forward. So we, we uh, monitor individual school and district enrollments changes and projections. And we attempt to keep school boundaries intact as at all possible. We understand that when parents and children start school, they really want to stay within those school boundaries. However, it comes a time when we have to make adjustments. The last time we had a major change was in 2011. It actually was my first year in Parkway. Much of the work had been done prior to me arriving here, but we spent the fall like we are this fall uh, going into the north area and we made some pretty significant boundary changes, some of which actually had students moving from the north area to the central area. So that was uh, you know, eight years ago now, and so here we are back with some needs again as we looked at projections. We've had two schools uh, on watch, a lot of schools that we're certainly monitoring, but two schools that we specifically had on watch, Craig and Shenandoah, and now they have reached a point where we need to make slight boundary shifts. We do realize that any time that you talk about boundary shifts, you do impact families and certainly students. We'd rather not have to make those changes, quite honestly. We'd rather uh, be able to keep our, our, our boundaries intact. But it's important that we have equity in our schools, in our school enrollments. Impacts, uh, uh, if we don't maintain those inequity or those equities, we'll have class size inequities, we'll have services that aren't be able to provide it equitably, we'll have personnel needs that we'll have to address. So we strive to make sure that our schools are safe, equitable, that class sizes and efficiency are certainly uh, important factors. So we certainly uh, uh, realize that while this impacts families, we have to be conscious of all students. All students are, need to be safe, not only your students, but all students, and they all need to have quality education. And we are fortunate in Parkway to have 18, element, 18 quality elementary schools that um, have all been uh, doing well and achieving well, 
and yet we know that certainly moving to schools is, is something that we want to take time and allow for that uh, process to, to be explained and, and thoroughly. We do have a board policy on boundary changes and redistricting, which we are following. If you want a link to that in our website, uh, you could find that. But the plan does call, first of all, for a presentation to our board, which we did complete in uh, September. And then uh, now the second part of that is to take our plan to those families that are impacted, which is what we're doing here tonight. Uh, we are starting early. I know some of you may not think that it's, it's early, but we have a significant uh, opportunity over the summer into the early fall to put a plan together to present to the board, and now want to present that to you. But we have time here to lay this out and also to uh, have time for the board to evaluate uh, the plan that we have put before them and hopefully uh, uh, move forward and, and we have then uh, the second semester to uh, implement the plans and for uh, the transition to begin. We are starting early uh, so, so we have this opportunity to have the course, this course and communication with our families. So we begin to, to talk tonight, and your, the part of the agenda tonight is going to have you hearing from the principals of uh, Craig and Shenandoah, where the attendance relief is needed. You'll hear a little bit about what they have been dealing with, what they uh, are dealing with currently, and what their concerns are for the future. You'll hear specifically about the plans to make our boundary changes, the rationale and, and, uh, and the impact. You'll learn more about our timeline, and then uh, later on, a little bit later here, we'll have a Q&A with school and district personnel. We'll break out, we'll tell you more about that, uh, but we'll break out by, um, by the two schools impacted here. So with, with that uh, with that introduction, and again, thank you for coming. We're gonna start, first of all, by talking a little bit about uh, how we arrived here, and I'm gonna turn the microphone now over to our CFO, Patty Bedborough. Patty? Thank you, Dr. Marty. Good evening. So this summer, um, we did a deep dive into our enrollment projections. These projections, if you look at the, oh, sorry, current reality, we're gonna have in a few minutes, both uh, principals, uh, Dr. Seacott, and then uh, Dr. Uh, Duckworth will give some specific explanations of their current reality of their enrollment in their schools. But just if we go by the numbers here, we start with Craig Elementary. If we look at their current enrollment for this year, 575 students. Um, Craig, um, we're gonna look at the classroom capacity, but right now, um, they exceed their current classroom capacity. If you walk the building, you know that they have instructional spaces in every nook and cranny available in the building. When we are looking, um, as Keith described, what are our options? We look, of course, at our neighboring schools. And if our neighboring schools have capacity to hold additional students. So we know with Craig Elementary, we have uh, the ability to move some students to Ross Elementary, and then some to the McKelvey Elementary as well. We go through a process where we looked at segmented uh, portions of the boundaries called neighborhood planning units. And in a few slides, we'll, we'll show you how we've identified um, those specific units. So as we've looked at this enrollment, the projections are only that Craig is supposed to grow in enrollment. Um, we then made that shift um, to the other schools so that we have a little bit more flexibility um, in Craig and that we have proper instructional spaces for all of our students in the Craig um, building. So up next, I'm gonna have Dr. Duckworth come up and give you um, a better explanation of exactly what um, his building looks like and what instruction looks like within Craig Elementary. All right, I'm Dr. David Duckworth, the uh, proud principal of Craig Elementary. I see some of my family is here. Thank you for being here. Uh, so enrollment is on the rise at Craig Elementary, it has been for a while. I look at that for really three main reasons. First reason, we are a very diverse area and people like the diversity. They want to be a part of that. They want to go to school with people that don't look like them, that they speak a different language. And so I hear a lot of our new families come in and say, we moved to this area for a specific reason. So that's one reason. 
The other reason our school culture. I know that our families that are here would speak to that. We have a positive, supportive school culture, and uh, people want to be a part of that. People want their kids to be in that type of school. And finally, they want to be a part of Parkway. As you guys all know, as parent, Parkway parents, I'm a Parkway parent. You want in the Parkway, and Craig is an avenue to do that. But as a result, as we've seen, our enrollment continues to grow. grow. If you look up here, currently uh, we have 30 classrooms at Craig Elementary. And the reality is only 24 of those are full-size classrooms. So we need 33 classrooms, but we really only have 30. So we have to be creative in making sure that we have that space available. And this year was a true test. We had to be creative at the last moment to ensure that we had enough space for all of our students and all of our staff. So what I want to do is just walk you through our current reality, just so you're fully aware of where we sit at Craig Elementary. First, looking at office space, we use every place that we can to ensure that our staff have a place to call home. They have a desk. They have a place that they can work with children. We use closets. We use project areas. In fact, we even use nooks and crannies in our library to ensure that we have that space. So for example, our technology person works in a project area that we created over the summer basically using walls or partitions to form that area. That's a space of about 128 square feet. In addition to that, our instructional coach who plays a vital role in the day-to-day -day operations at Craig Elementary, she works out of a space that's 50 square feet in our library. No walls, she just works in that space. In addition to that, we have math interventionists. We have two math interventionists at Craig Elementary, and they work in a closet that's about 50 square feet, one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two with children. And finally, our SAC examiner works in a similar space that was a closet, was storage, that now is a class, or her classroom, her office space, in which she works one-on-one -on -one with children. So as a result, storage, where does it go? You're using your closet space, you have to be creative. So for example, our violins for orchestra sit in the hallway because our orchestra teacher actually has to work in different places throughout the building as well because we don't have a home for strings. So we store our equipment in the hallway at a central location so we can get that equipment. Our music teacher, when they're not using the risers, they sit in the hallway. Our project areas, we've been creative in terms of our resources and materials. So as you can see, they're kind of stacked into a nicely organized closet space, but it's actually open as students bypass, again, because our closet space are being used for homes or our teachers. Instructional spaces, this is key. Our ESL teachers work in a project area that we created over the summer in a space of about 128 square feet. So we have two of these teachers. We have anywhere from 75 to 100 students that receive EL services throughout the year. And those students work in small groups in that space, not ideal. Before I came to Craig Elementary, they had full-size classrooms that they worked out of. And now they're working in a 128 square feet area. Mosaics, our gifted group, are working in a small classroom that used to be for special education. Now they're in a 170 foot square foot uh, area. Our orchestra, as I mentioned earlier, they either push into the classrooms or work out of our cafeteria. That makes it difficult in two ways. Number one, if you're in the cafeteria, you have to schedule in the morning or later in the afternoon because you have your lunch hour the bulk of the day. But if you push into a classroom, the other classrooms are continuing instruction during that time. And although we are making some beautiful music in third grade, right, Jasmine? Beautiful music. Uh, we also are disruptive to the learning environment, to the areas nearby. Finally, this year we had to be creative with the six <coughs> kindergarten classrooms. So we have six kindergartens this year. And so we had to move one of our special education programs to Bell Reeve in order to make room for that space. And so our kindergarten classroom currently that we made uh, space for is at 640 square feet. That's compared to almost 1,000 square feet of our normal classroom size for other kindergarten classrooms. 
And so this is a smaller blueprint. We have less students in that particular class, again, because of the smaller class size. Some other obstacles that we've encountered, cafeteria. Our cafeteria only sits 96 students per session. So we have more kindergarten students than that this year. And so we had to split our kindergarten group. So one kindergarten class actually goes to lunch with a fourth grade group because there's not enough room for all kindergarten to go at the same time. In addition to that, we have to split specials, meaning that we don't have six special areas in the same time. So we have to split that six classroom into sections so that all of our kindergarten teachers can have common plan at the same time. Lastly, our library, and we're very appreciative of this, but our library a couple of years ago was shifted in which we built seven classroom spaces. So our reading interventionists work out of the library, our special education classrooms are in the library, and again, that's a smaller footprint then ultimately for our library. So we do have some situations that we're working through now, we're being very creative, but as we can see, our enrollment continues to grow. It is something that we need to take action. I'd like to just thank Dr. Marty and his team and the Board of Education for putting this event on just so we can talk about our current reality and ultimately for decisions to be coming to ensure that all students throughout Parkway have a space to be successful in education. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Duckworth. So now to go into the proposed boundary changes. So many of you know that if you're here, you most likely received a notification, either via email or um, with mail or both, um, that perhaps you're in the proposed boundary changes area. So for Craig Elementary, um, the area that is currently in pink on this slide is Craig Elementary. The light green area is the current Ross Elementary, and the darker green is the current McKelvey Elementary. We worked with uh, Will Roses in the back of the room. He's our director of transportation. We worked with his system, his bus system, VersaTrans, um, in order to look at neighborhood planning units that were either close to Ross Elementary or right on the border. We tried to ensure that we weren't breaking up subdivisions. Um, we knew that there was one apartment complex that already had confusion whether or not they went to Ross or to Craig. So those were easy um, areas for us to look at and identify and to, to do our planning around them. So here is the portion that will be moving from Craig Elementary to McKelvey Elementary. And here is the portion that then will move to Ross Elementary. Um, with that, you know, a lot of factors went in, you know, not only location, uh, bus routes, but also the number of students because what we didn't want to do was overburden the receiving school as well. So next up, we have Shenandoah Valley. Um, once again, Dr. Seacott will go through, um, much like Dr. Duckworth did, everything with his current reality. To begin with, we want to look at the five-year projections that we had uh, for student capacity, so for enrollment. We know that this year his enrollment was higher than the initial projection. I should add that that same thing um, happened for Craig as well. And then we know in the future that that enrollment is um, forecasted to be growing as well. So with the element, with the shift then, um, we go from a school that's 507 students currently, then down to um, hopefully a school of around 450 or so. Dr. Seacott, would you like to provide, do you want to? All right, thank you all for coming tonight. Get an opportunity to share our current reality at Shenandoah Valley. Um, what I would like to point out is currently this first year, we are one classroom short. Going into next year, we will be three classrooms short. So I'll show you a little bit of 
how that, how that looks for us currently and what that will look like for us next year. So here's a graphic that I created. Maybe a little overwhelming, but I, what I did is took the school map, put it into grade level so you can see that we have kindergarten on down to third, and then our special area classes, and then fifth grade and fourth grade. But I want to zoom in to the 500 wing and talk a little bit about where we are with the 500 wing. Um, room 503 and 504 and room 500 prior to this year, those were three special education classrooms or specialized programs. So basically in 503 and 504, two teachers, 11 other adults, and 18 students. And room 500 is our occupational therapy and physical therapy classroom uh, that provides a lot of equipment and different things that those students are able to use. If you look straight across from room 504, you see two arrows going into small little rooms there. Those are for, that's for individual therapy. So that's kind of a nice little hub for the needs of those students to be right there in that location. Now, if we look at the beginning of this year, we added a fifth section of first grade due to our enrollment increasing. And that fifth section of first grade went into room 503. So therefore, we moved that special education classroom to make space for uh, that fifth section of first grade. Our kindergarten numbers are very high at the moment. We're currently at 22 students per class. We just enrolled another kindergartner today. Um, and so what that tells me about room 503 is that 503 is also going to be a first grade classroom next year because we will need the fifth section. We hired a teaching assistant in the kindergarten this year to help relieve the class size and support the classroom teachers. Um, and then when we look at um, the special ed location, room that teacher, the special ed teacher in room 503 then moved to room 500. So she went from that first classroom to this classroom right here that's 16 feet by 16 feet. So where did the occupational therapy and all the equipment go? Uh, looking at the space that we have, I moved them down to room 009. Uh, the equipment, however, was not able to go with them, so we had to send that back to special school district because the type of equipment that we use in occupational therapy, some of the larger equipment, we can't just leave that in a hallway for students to access. It does need to be in a closed room. So our uh, occupational therapy room is in our life skills lab. We have a life skills lab that uh, we have teachers that sign up for students that need to learn how to do dishes, um, just normal everyday living types of um, learning. And so we use this room now for two things. We use it for occupational therapy and we use it for uh, the life skills lab. So looking ahead at, if we currently have five sections of first grade, that tells me that we're most likely gonna have five sections of second grade going into next year. So if you look at room 504, that would then need to become a second grade classroom. So if 504 became a classroom, then where would I relocate that special education classroom? And again, there are spaces this could take. I could move three people right now just for, just, just for purposes of showing you what three classrooms short look like. I'm just making one move at a time. So there could be several other moves that, that could happen. People will be um, relocated within the building. But these are the spaces that we have available that are over 12 by 12. So room 504 would go to 704, which is a uh, math intervention office that's currently, oh, this, I'm sorry. This is special education classroom 504 currently. Next year it would be a second grade classroom. And that special education, re rearranging our current special education, this room for our math interventionist, which is a nice size for math intervention, would then become a special education classroom. Looking ahead, we currently have, if you look in the orange box, that's our fourth grade pod. Our fourth grade pod, we currently have four sections of fourth grade. We currently have three sections of fifth grade. And our fifth grade pod, which is the purple ring, room 703 is currently houses our mosaics program. So the mosaics program would have to relocate somewhere else and that location would then be 
the other space that's over, like I said, 12 by 12 or over by 16 by 16, that would be the staff lounge. So here's the current mosaics room. That would be a fifth grade classroom next year. And then here is the staff lounge that we would use as an instructional space for mosaics for special education. Like again, we can move things different places. I'm just showing you the spaces that we have available. And then the last piece, um, looking to the future of Shenandoah, we currently, um, 13%, well, around 12% of our population is English language learners. And we have a full-time ESL teacher on staff. She's currently in an office space uh, with students. That's that bottom one there. It sits inside of the Mosaics classroom. Uh, she's currently in a classroom that is 12 by 12. Within the next eight years, we're expected, projected, to be at 27% ELL population at Shenandoah. Um, so thinking way ahead, I'm definitely going to need a bigger space, uh, instructional space for our EL program to flourish. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seacott. So then as we look at the proposed boundaries for um, the changes from Shenandoah Valley to Highcroft, we, we first began looking at what are the areas that are very close to Highcroft Elementary. Highcroft Elementary is in kind of the center over on the right side where you see the red portion with the flag. As you can see, there are many areas in Shenandoah Valley that are actually, could be within walking distance to Highcroft Elementary. So of course, those are the first neighborhood planning units that we looked at. So as we, we um, re revisited that and started counting the students with the enrollment, we did identify this area as being the best um, area to move into the Highcroft Elementary boundary. And then to talk further about the transition, we have Paul Tandy, our Chief Communication and Emergency Management Officer. So uh, this was in your packet. I'll just quickly go through the recommendations that we have in terms of the implementation plan. Uh, we are recommending grandfathering would be incoming fourth grade students for next year. So if you're in the 1920 um, school year or incoming fifth grader, so if you're fourth grader this year, you'd be grandfathered to stay if you choose and transportation would be provided. And if you have siblings at the current school as well, then uh, your siblings could remain as well for one more year with, with transportation uh, provided. For special assignments, if you're familiar with that process, um, if you're in, in an affected area and you're in grades K through three and you wish to request a special assignment to remain at your current school, uh, you can do so and it would be approved if space is available in the grade level that you're requesting. However, as is our custom with um, uh, special assignments, transportation would not be provided. And siblings who did not currently attend the school would not be applied for a special assignment. And we're gonna provide more information, I'll talk about that here in just a minute about um, how that will work. If you don't currently attend, the, the school's impacted, and so you'd be an incoming new student altogether. Uh, special assignments would not be considered. And then obviously when new families come in and move in and enroll uh, in those areas, they would go to the new school once board approval, if, board, if the board approves it. And of course, transportation would be provided for them. So you heard uh, the two principals talk about the, the needs and the issues that the schools have been facing in the past few years. We've been watching them. We don't talk a lot about those things, uh, but uh, they are making do, and uh, they have exceeded their classroom capacity. And it's um, the current enrollment projections we got this fall in October are pretty much right on with what we thought. In fact, they're actually a little, a little bit higher than what we had in May. So um, they are projected to continue to increase. Uh, and as was mentioned earlier, we're fortunate that we have neighboring schools that have capacity. That isn't always the case. Sometimes this happens 
and we don't have capacity, we have to look at other options. Um, so if we don't make this change, or if we basically allow it to happen over time, it just basically pushes the issues off for multiple years. Some other factors to consider, um, if you were to allow the current families to remain enrolled, uh, and then the new students going through the new school, we would have to increase buses and drivers because you would have essentially um, students on the same streets and neighborhoods going to two different schools. So I, obviously that's not ideal. It's also not good from when that has happened in the past. Um, good chance you get on the wrong bus. It's not, it's not a good uh, solution. And we are having trouble finding drivers. I look back at Will, but we're having trouble finding drivers as it is. And uh, so to add more buses and routes is not what we really would want to do. So what's next? Uh, the school board will, is tentatively scheduled to revisit it at their November meeting, and they might vote that night. Um, and if they do approve it, uh, then what you need to watch for is a mailing. We'll send you a mailing because we need to know some information from you. Uh, for example, um, what are your preferences about grandfathering, if that applies to you? Do you intend to take advantage of the grandfathering? And if so, we need to know how many students that we're talking about. We'll also give you information about the special assignment process and how you can apply and how that will work. And you'll have some uh, dates and, and times so you can see how that process would, uh, would work. And then we'll also talk about transition activities that are planned for uh, the schools that would be receiving new students because they'll have activities over the next semester planned uh, to welcome those new families. So we're gonna figure out how we're gonna break out. I'm looking for Chelsea. And uh, depending on who's here. But uh, I wanna point out this email address. So after tonight, we'll, you know, we have an opportunity to ask questions at the tables. Uh, but if for some reason you have a question that you either weren't able to ask or you asked and somebody didn't have the answer for it, uh, please jot down this email. And we would encourage you to email us if uh, you didn't get your questions answered. So let me first introduce the um, principals who are here who have not been already introduced. And from Ross Elementary, you have Dr. Lisa Luna, principal at Ross. Dr. Kim Cohen is with McKelvey Elementary. And Mrs. Cartelia Lucas with Highcroft Ridge. So are we going to go to room 403? Let's see. Maybe we get, yes. I mean, the questions would be specific to your school, I assume. So. I'd let Dr. Marty answer that if you'd like to. Well, we can uh, we can take a few minutes, but we really wanted to break you up by by school because you then will have a chance to meet the uh, incoming principals or the receiving principals, and then also deal with specific questions. But we'll we'll take a question or two, so fire away. Thank you because. Uh, I, I want to say first that the Office of God Dr. Butler uh, is amazed at the job that you're doing because based on what you just showed us, that does not like this problem is going to go on for a while. And so it's feeling like this is very much a scramble in a crisis moment. And uh, you know, I just want to point out I kind of feel like the board had more tactics sooner, making this a gradual transition could have been possible. Because I have written the board a couple of times. Yes, that's the point of our problem. Is our neighboring district as many of 
where everyone at the school is from the kind of community, like the population of more than 10 uh, But I think without having that information, I don't know how you can say, well, we would still have to Why not send out families asking which families would be interested in staying if there's no transportation? I understand it's going to be And it seems like that's going to be something that's going to keep a lot of families out instead of what they're so I'd really like the board members who have shown up to tell us, you know, why can't we get to the point on this? Then rather than, you know, voting for these people and finding out how many actual families are we talking about who said if you want to stay and stay, as opposed to leaving it up to a special assignment where we're in the middle until probably late in the spring. So I, I would just like to have the address all of all of well, I'm, the board is here tonight to listen, so I'll, I'll respond. Um, <clears throat> uh, we have a number of uh, uh, Shenandoah families who are already going to, are, are using the Advantage Special Assignment. In fact, we have 17 students in the Shenandoah district that are in high up right now. So people have already begun to make that, uh, those decisions and those choices. So your suggestion is one we would, you know, we could look into. Again, the board uh, and the administration, you know, thinks that's a worthy one. However, you noted that we, our, the problem that, that Shenandoah, we have to we have to recover three classrooms. No, absolutely. And, and, and so we have we have a here that we have one hundred and fifty real kids and uh even one of the because of the four kids. Well so that's why I'm thinking like if if there's yeah. some way here and you know when when we were told about this meeting, it was very clear we could make the way, which is why I And the board, the board is here today. I, I will just say that um, the board and, and the administration work closely together. The board has been kept informed about enrollment growth. And as I said in my introductory comments, we rather not move students until we have to. So we're at that point where uh, projections from last year went sped up both of these two schools. We'd like to put it off. So we're here tonight, early in the school year, <clears throat> you know, to begin to talk about plans to make that change and hopefully the board approving so we can use the second semester for that transition. So we'll, we'll again uh, you know, look at any suggestions and we welcome as, as, that, as Paul Candy put up there, uh, recommendations or suggestions or uh, more questions. All right, so I, I think our plan was tonight to have this discussion, and uh, I'd like to suggest that the Shenandoah family stay here, and then I think was it the, um, where's Chelsea? Was the, we're gonna ask the Craig families to go to an area around the corner, right? And we'll have that discussion. I mean, so I think we're, we're into that discussion, but I think let's do it by, by school, because then we'll have the principals and district administrators and board members will join in that listening as well. So let's, let's proceed with that, because I think uh, we're at a point where we can, you know, deal with the two schools, but I think there may be some separate issues or separate concerns based on the two schools. So board members, we have both rooms, so that they we have five board, board yeah, five board members, and they can divide up, and, and they, yeah, we, they will. I'm sure they can do that. We can help them do that. Um, so, Dr. Watson, do you want to get the directions? Yes. Yes. So, if you currently attend Craig and are scheduled to potentially go to right around the corner to the classroom, okay? And the principals are going to go with us. And if you are currently at Shenandoah Central High Rock, you're right up front.
board members, if you want to divide yourself up accordingly. So, uh, if you're, uh, why don't you make, why don't you come on up to the front closer so we can hear each other, and then we'll uh, put some chairs here for us to kind of get in a bit of a circle. So. If you're sitting in the back, uh, Shannon, don't parents, why don't you come move up a little bit? Kind of get into a more of a circle.